introduce with uh, uh, the more recent uh, issue of this uh, journal, EuroHealth, which is published by the European Observatory uh, on Health uh, Systems and Policies. And uh, the, the topic of this, uh, of this issue is uh, integrated care. Integrated care is like a magic palette. Everyone uh, in every health system try to develop uh, a more integrated delivery of healthcare. But how to do that? Uh, of course, we, we would all agree that uh, we want to have uh, a more integrated care, but how to do that is not an easy question. I quote here two sentences from the Health Service Journal. We all agree that integrated care is the way forward. However, we need to make sure we have the same vision of it. And that's not straightforward at all. What is not yet generally agreed is quite what integrated care means, let alone how to achieve it. And according to uh, a research by the King's Fund, there are 175 separate definitions currently used around the world of integrated care. So it shows how much confusion, how much diversity uh, uh, do exist in this domain. There are, as you know, different options. One option is to have an insurance-driven or a top-down health network versus the more uh, grassroots, bottom-up uh, networks. Which kind of network do we, do we have in mind? The second point is we can have networks uh, with financial responsibility where we use the very strong power of financial incentives to align the interest of doctors with those of the patients. Or we can have uh, other ways of organizing without uh, using too much financial incentives. So, what I would like to uh, invite you uh, to follow in this, uh, in this uh, one hour with me it is a journey, a journey through health networks from north to south. We will start in uh, North America, where uh, sometimes we believe that many innovations come from. So, not every time true, but we will start with, uh, have a, with, with a presentation on uh, uh, the Canadian approach to integrated care and the North American, the, the um, um, US, United States approach, the accountable organization. Then we will move downwards to, um, uh, to England, to see how the UK tries to tackle the problem. Maybe we will discuss a little bit also of Switzerland. But I think uh, our uh, target is to, to get to the low and uh, uh, middle income countries, to get to, to Africa. So this is uh, the way that we try to go. And uh, the people who will accompany me uh, in this journey are, uh, maybe I, I present uh, one after the other. So uh, I start by Gary Watt. Is uh, uh, currently vice president uh, of scientific affairs at the Institut, Institut National de Santé Publique du Québec. He has acquired a broad experience in clinical preventive medicine and in public health policy, practice, teaching, and research over the last 30 years. He is also associate professor at the Social and Preventive Medicine Department, University of Montreal, and adjunct professor at the Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Medicine Department. McGill University. So, all health systems face common challenges, both of demand, both of supply, resource constraints, and uh, we have to find new ways to uh, really do our job in, in a better way, in a more effective way. So, health networks have, has been described as an adaptive strategy to transform the health response facing these common challenges. Recently, Jean-Louis Denis and colleagues have uh, conducted a knowledge synthesis on successful system transformation. And I think that's uh, the focus of my, this morning talk because implementing health networks is a significant transformation. So uh, the Quebec case I think is really strong on it. So he suggested that strategic realignment uh, efforts, organization and networks as engine for delivering change professional cultures, enabling environments, patient engagement, and obviously evidence-informed decision-making are all potent contributors to successful transformation. Now, 
networks and how do they interact with these cross-cutting things that John Medina has described. First, uh, a couple of definitions here and key issues with networks. Obviously, networks are, uh, have common characteristics, irrespective of context. First, they regroup uh, or they uh, interconnect organizations in new ways to achieve a common goal. This idea of shared vision and common goals is a, is a critical one. They are often formally established and governed and goal-directed. That's the, the, the particular Quebec case in the U.S. as well. They are market-driven, uh, but they are uh, goal-directed and they are formally governed. Uh, relationships among network members are primarily non-hierarchical and participants often have substantial operating autonomy. It's somehow uh, uh, rooted in the professional culture. It's, it's self-organization and self-discipline to some extent. When to use a network? It's not a one-size-fits-all solution, but it's, uh, it's quite a, a versatile strategy. Well, it's certainly when you need to adapt more effectively, and the recent study by Proban and colleagues uh, summarized this very nicely. You, you, you use a network when the resources, knowledge, and solutions are spread across many different entities. So you share uh, competent uh, capacities. Uh, when a coordinated response from a multitude of organizations is required in order to, uh, to appropriately serve client needs. And that was certainly the bottom line in the Quebec case. We, we needed a concerted effort that was not uh, happening spontaneously. And uh, non usual uh, wicked problems also uh, sometimes require networks, but it's, I think, another topic that we won't cover this way. Uh, key advantages, well, it leverages limited resources, enhance range of service, allow for more flexibility, highly flexible solution originate from network. And enhance responsiveness, it's, it's, it's well managed, may achieve economies of scale, exert more pressure on politicians. So it, become, it can become a political tool to influence the, the policy agenda. But these are theoretically uh, plausible properties. Empirically, we'll see that it may or may not be uh, fully demonstrated, but that's, that were basically the assumptions that were made in the Quebec, and I think in most of the US work that I've seen. Uh, typical network problems. Uh, varied commitment to network goals. Uh, people may, may not follow the game plan or may not fully adhere to the, the stated goals. Culture clash, power issues, loss of autonomy, coordination fatigue, potential for reduced accountability by participants, and a difficulty to manage. Actually, it was uh, the reason why we worked with Fred Paco and Eric Lidbach, and we came together with this recent of the English language publication on basically how do you manage health networks? What are the key principles? Building blocks, strategies. So that's the purpose of this book, and we're quite happy that we can publish uh, in English now so that we can share to the uh, global audience. Our health networks are a relevant solution globally. Uh, I would tend to think that it's probably the case. At least that's what I uh, get from my teaching experience here at the summer school. Some insights from our experience then. First in Canada, uh, you may know that uh, health in Canada is a profession, professional, provincial responsibility. We have 10 provinces uh, and, and they get federal money uh, if they satisfy five criteria that are stated here. So it's first dollar, uh, first dollar universal coverage of all medically required services, hospital and doctors mostly. One key feature of the Canadian health uh, policy is uh, its population-based orientation and its prevention bias. So we have uh, observed uh, much regionalized practice and policy in, in, uh, in uh, Canada at large. But in Quebec, we have uh, been uh, a bit more aggressive in terms of decentralization, if I can say so. So we have three levels of governments, the health ministry, the regional agencies, by number of 18, and within each region we have a number of local health services that were implemented eight years ago. So we have uh, a local integrator, which is a center, 
uh, who is in charge of a given geographically defined population locally. So we have 95 uh, uh, local services network for a population of 8 million. So this is the, the, the device uh, in question. So we have this um, social services center <coughs> really has a global, global budget for some primary care, uh, community-based facilities, hospital care, as well as long-term care. So this is the, the big player in the network. Uh, this uh, it has its own board, and they manage the global budget for the, their population base. It's more or less uh, adjusted for population size in terms of size of budget. And they have the, the state-mandated responsibility to establish network relationships with all these players that you can recognize, community organizations, community-based pharmacies, physicians. Physicians do retain their autonomy in terms of reimbursement and funding sources. So they are mostly fee-for-service, but less and less fee-for-service and more and more capitated. But it's really a distinct funding source. I think it's an important uh, factor in mind. And we have also, out of the territory, a number of specialized services that are displayed at the bottom. And obviously, we have, uh, by uh, mandate, the responsibility to establish intersectoral links, that is, connecting with schools, municipalities, so that we can put together a health and health policy uh, governance type structure. So, a very interesting, uh, quite innovative uh, network structure that, uh, that has been implemented uh, over the last eight years. Uh, at first, there were quite uh, uh, chaos because it was a major restructuring, but uh, I think I'd say that for the last four years, in most jurisdictions, it's, it's uh, alive and well and working. So what they, they work towards these networks is they basically adopted the tripling uh, strategy that has been described internationally, improving health, improving patient and clinical experience, improving value for money. That's really the, the bottom line. Health, patient experience, value for money. So they are attempting to achieve those three aims uh, by the same token. In practice, over the last years, what we've observed is that the top-down forces, the accountability, central planning policies, and in, uh, centrally defined incentives have been the primary force for change. Bottom-up forces have operated, and uh, uh, thanks to the autonomy and self-organizing capacity of our network, but also the drive for innovation and context-specific strategies. But by and large, central top-down forces have dominated the uh, agenda. Uh, nonetheless, we observe interesting trends here. So I'll uh, just present in a few minutes interesting data. So that's the. The, the trend for premature mortality that we've observed. So major reduction for most uh, system and problem areas. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good news. Uh, more effective primary care, if, uh, as measured by the ambulatory care sensitive conditions. So we're catching up, actually, as compared to Ontario, who did not proceed to uh, further decentralization health network uh, type strategy. So they, they basically kept their centralized approach and we decentralized more, we created networks and we're actually catching up in terms of uh, primary care. Integration of care, not that great improvement as you can see. Uh, uh, it's more or less stable and it's such for a number of uh, more complex type issues that uh, require uh, uh, excellent coordination of care. And the flat there, no change. The more complex issue, so do, how do you tackle this one is a difficult question. But no, it didn't show any significant improvement. Uh, so real progress in Quebec, lasting challenges. We, I think, have uh, the benefit to work with the mobilizing vision. We deal with local enough, innovative partnerships and projects. Health, global, uh, uh, provincial health improvement trend but we have a concern with the growing social inequities. That's a global concern, not specific to Quebec, obviously. Maybe less so than in the rest of Canada that's still present. More effective primary care, particularly for elderly care, and uh, uh, integration of services, particularly for chronic disease, remains uh, difficult. A bit, uh, a few words on the healthcare 
uh, if reform occurring in the US, it's, uh, uh, they basically uh, build on two complementary strategies. First, the patient-centered medical home strategy. Second, the accountable care organization strategy. They basically want to build on the, these, these two driving forces and try to create some synergy between the two. So we, we, we know, and I won't expand on what is patient-centered medical home, but I think it's, uh, it's really the, the uh, global aim that's pursued across the world right now, and uh, certainly one of the key policy focus as well in Canada. And as far as accountable care organization, it's really pushing the public health administration uh, agenda ahead, uh, working with uh, um, strong leadership for uh, uh, accountability management and uh, uh, reporting, aligning incentives and uh, some population uh, orientation as well. So we, you see the, the major key descriptors. ACOs are all over the place and now in the US. They are basically market oriented, market based. So you understand that in Quebec we had state mandated, in the US it's market driven. Uh, obviously the Obamacare was, was the, the, the policy uh, drive originally, but it can adapt to the different cultural contexts and lead to interesting innovation as well. Uh, no, obviously no conclusive data on the US experience at this point, but much innovation. And uh, there are certainly hundreds of paper every week in my, in my scientific uh, uh, surveillance that I do. I see all kinds of publication uh, every week and it's a very important drive. So basically what I see in the US, agreeing, they, they, despite their huge market and political force, they were able to to merge really the potential of patient centered medical homes and ACOs and try to accomplish high performance uh, health networks dynamics. To what extent it will happen, we'll see. It's too early to, to say, but it is certainly uh, an excellent start and people are quite enthusiastic. My friends in the US are very enthusiastic about what's happening. Concluding remarks on health networks and collaborative governance, I think what the bottom line is, is that we have to merge somehow two cultures. This professional bureaucracy that, uh, that has been uh, with us for years, self-discipline, auto-regulation, professional dedication, uh, culture of continuous improvement and sharing and collaborating, with new public management, which is uh, stated objectives and goals, accountability schemes, measurement, feedback, alignment, you know, these are interesting approaches that are, I think, complementary to a large extent. In, in managed networks, we have to make it a reality. We have to bridge somehow these two cultures. And uh, uh, in other words, we, we will need clin strong clinical leadership and strong management and policy leadership. And this may lead us to high-performing health networks. I think in a, in a nutshell, to conclude, it's my final word, I think what we uh, have been able to achieve in my context is a fair amount of strategic realignment efforts, building on networks and organizations that really has the engine for change. Uh, we have more difficulty creating these enabling environments. Uh, we've used evidence to some extent, but it's not systematized in the way we, we actually monitor and uh, make sure that we uh, improve uh, what's happening. And uh, we'll, we still uh, have not addressed significantly professional cultures and patient engagement at the patient at the system level. Local innovations, but it's not been fully integrated in the policy work that we've been doing. So we've achieved some improvements, I believe, but uh, there's lot, still uh, lots to, to, to do if we want to fulfill Jean-Guy's Denis' uh, success uh, transformation and successful transformation preconditions. Thanks very much for your, your attention. Thank you, uh, Denis. I think uh, he was producing a positive externality to the other speakers because he you have saved five minutes of your, of your time, but it's great for, uh, for the discussion. So, we, uh, I suggest that we move, uh, we move downwards to, uh, uh, to England, but Mark is, uh, I think, no, you are, you are, was, uh, was born in uh, South Africa, so I think uh, very south in our journey. 
He has a PhD in uh, economics from the University of York and 14 years experience as a research and senior research fellow at the Center for Health Economics of the University of York. And I am proud to say that from uh, uh, August 1st, 2013, he has been awarded as his PH plus professorship, assist, as, uh, assistant professorship at the EMS uh, Institute of Economy and Management de la Sante of the University of Lausanne. So uh, this week we had, we had the opportunity to meet uh, three of our new assistant professor out of the five that we uh, selected uh, this year. So Mark, uh, please uh, uh, talk. <laughs> So I'm going to look at how um, health networks uh, integrated care has evolved in the UK and, and hopefully Switzerland and contrast the sort of top-down politically driven forces in the UK to the much more uh, grassroots approaches we've seen in, in Switzerland. So just looking at the situation in the UK, what's the major problem at the moment is, well, is much, there's a big increase in the demand for healthcare, but this is manifesting itself particularly in accident and emergency attendance, attendances. So we've seen over the last decade, there's been a, a large rise of about 8 million attendances at A&E departments. And this phenomenon, I mean, there's a lot of factors, and we can discuss them later, but it's really probably a reflection of you know, issues with access, coordination, uh, quality of care in the community. And this, I mean, this phenomenon hasn't gone unnoticed. So there's a, a lot of political pressure now, talks of, you know, this is completely unsustainable. Uh, the, the, the message is coming from A&E departments is I can't cope. Um, and the government recognised that even in a time of austerity, the government said, OK, we're going to make extra money available. I think David Cameron announced another three billion uh, of extra funds to go into addressing this problem. And a lot of that's going to go into trying to get care better in, in the primary care and community care sector to reduce this pressure on, on hospitals. Uh, so just looking at how, how the demand is distributed across the different uh, healthcare sectors. So in the UK, most people you see, you know, 70% see their general practitioner at least once. And this is not surprising, it's a gatekeeping healthcare system, everyone registers their general practitioner, and they're very much at the centre of the, of the healthcare system. But, as you can see, there's a, there's a lot of different types of ways people can access care. So this is raising issues around coordination. We see uh, quite a high percent, you know, 20% go to at least a &E once in the year. Um, outpatient, many outpatient visits. And there's other ways, uh, there's sort of walk-in centres, these are you know, easy access, uh, primary care, polyclinics. So, you know, again, the, uh, social care, small fraction, but again, it's going to become a much more important area. So bringing all these different healthcare providers together, coordinating care, is going to be a real challenge. So uh, another uh, look at the latest healthcare reform in the UK is a, another of a series of ongoing healthcare reforms. Um, essentially, it builds on the evolution of, of the internal market in the UK. So, uh, in, under Margaret Thatcher in the 90s, they separated out the, the purchasing of healthcare, essentially the sort of insurance uh, function, and the, and the provision, the, um, the, the hospital, acute care sector, community care sector. And this was to try and create a market uh, whereby uh, purchasers would look for the better quality providers and, and try and create some dynamism in the, in the healthcare sector. Uh, the latest reform uh, looks to sort of create uh, an integrated um, healthcare network built around general practitioners. So general practitioners are going to be given responsibility for managing uh, two-thirds of the NHS budget, so it's about £65 billion. Pounds. It's a lot of money, it's a lot of responsibility. Uh, in the past, that's been managed by a sort of uh, uh, a kind of um, overriding management bureaucracy called Primary Care Trust that was seen to become quite detached from, from the primary care and the grassroots. And so this is to try and really get clinical, uh, clinical leaders, uh, knowledgeable people around, what, people who have daily experience of patient needs, to get them into a decision-making um, authority about how best to allocate money and what, what service to invest in. So this is going to be around the term commissioning. So what, what we mean by uh, what we mean by commissioning, that's essentially understanding first of all what, what, the pop what your local population health needs are, uh, identifying the types of services that could be used to address the health needs, prioritising them, saying well, which one's going to be the most effective, most effective, or the most necessary, and obviously implementing planning, contracting, and, and getting the services delivered by providers. And in the UK, essentially, the, the provider market has become very competitive. So, private sector and public sector hospitals. Um, 
community to the extent they can all enter the market now and these purchases will be able to choose from this range of providers. So there's, there's the idea to integrate, but there's also the idea to, to have competition. So they're trying to both both integrate and create competition in this sort of healthcare provision, which is quite a challenge. And but the other function of these, these clinical commissioning groups, which are they are a health network of general practitioners, and their, their goal will also be to, to try and improve their performance. So you know, by having a network, you can look at your peers, you can compare performance, you can discuss what's most effective. So those are sort of two functions that these clinical commissioning groups will, will be aiming to um, address. So just to quickly, the NHS, the structure, um, it's a tax finance healthcare system, so everyone just pays taxes, and then it's a political decision about how much of those taxes will be allocated to the NHS. Patients don't have to purchase insurance or, or pay for their NHS healthcare. Um, it's the Department of Health who is then responsible for sort of implementing government policy. So the government will decide how they, they want this money to be spent, and the Department of Health will support this. And then it's the NHS, sorry, it's the NHS who will then obviously be responsible for implementing this. And what's happening is the money is going to clinicians. Most of the money is going to clinical commissioning groups, and it's also split with um, the public public health. So, so there is a separation between public health and these clinical commissioning groups, which is an issue. Um, public health will be dealt with by sort of local authorities which deliver public services. But the idea is that well, first of all, these groups must make strong links with public health because I think you know public health is, has to be integrated with service provision and then these groups will then purchase uh, community and, and secondary care health services um, which patients receive. They, they've separated out primary care from these groups because it would, it would be too much of a conflict of interest essentially if, if these groups could also control you know how many other GP practices could enter the area I mean essentially there's, there's anti-competitive competitive forces there so that's why they've separated it out. So looking at the structure of these clinical commissioning groups so this is a, the most general case so what, what happens is, although it's a network of potential primary care providers, it, it's still very hierarchical. I mean, it's, there's, a, there's a government's board, you know, a chair, a chief executive, a financial officer, management support, basically people who used to be in the primary care trust as managers are now in the, in the clinical commissioning group. Um, the idea is that to get more, uh, get more, to get more locally, get more grassroots intelligence, they've created locality subgroups, which um, VAs with the, the practices on the ground, and, and there is a sort of council of members which, which meet, you know, every quarter to of, of all the general practitioners who meet to discuss issues around service delivery. And the idea is that well, from the ground, they need to be feeding up this this information to support decision making at the top. Um, they, there's also links between the clinical commissioning groups, often due to sort of resources. I mean, if there isn't that much management resources. Uh, the groups need to pool. Uh, you know, Financial responsibility, contracting. If you, can, if you get to be negotiating with hospitals or other providers, it's good to have a large population base to negotiate with. It gives you sort of bargaining power over hospitals. And, and they also can purchase support from a, this is a sort of an administrative um, body, it's called the Commission Support Unit, but they have a lot of uh, data and do a lot of data analysis for, for these groups to provide them with details about their referrals, admissions to hospitals, and so, so on. So looking at the characteristics of these groups, they're quite different. I mean, there's quite a lot of heterogeneity in size. The average size is around 250,000. And I mean, it's seen as necessary that they're large because of the financial risk. If you're too small um, and you can basically allocate a budget based on the expected expenditures of your population, if you're too small, then you might find yourselves in financial difficulty just because of, um, because of you know, a severe winter flu epidemic or sort of un unexpected variation in, in um, health of your population. Uh, but, but again, you know, there's a lot of diversity in England. Some very big groups are likely to be in London, the inner cities. And they average around, um, there's 211 groups, so they're quite local, they average around 34 uh, general practices. Just again, looking at the, the geographic distribution, um, well, this is looking at the prevalence of dementia across the different ge uh, geographically defined clinical commissioning groups. So again, the first thing to point out, there's a lot of heterogeneity. And this, this is the point of making them local. I mean, there's, there's clearly, you know, dementia is going to be much more of a priority in the, the southwest, a lot of elderly retired individuals along the coast, and it's going to be in some of the younger, more affluent you know, city areas. So this is the idea of, you know, prioritization needs to be allocated 
decentralized and make, make things real. There's been some research actually studying some of these case studies of these groups to see their sort of network structure. So these are these sort of social network diagrams. And these are two different clinical provisioning groups. So, so what's quite interesting is already there are two groups that have got quite different structures. I mean, this is really dominated by one main board member, sort of the, the, the lead chair, the GP chair. He seems to be the, the main uh, influence on the network. And that shows how, how, much, um, how much of the communication goes through him. He's, he's linked with another clinical commissioning board, so they're doing joint commissioning. And these two central players seem to be very important, much less important than these other board members. They've got quite weak links between the sort of peripheral general practitioners and other acute providers. Whereas this group, you can see it, it seems to be much more, um, much more, uh, much more responsibility, delegated, and decentralized. There's no one big player there. Um, there's strong links across the whole group. It seems to be much more of a network. You know, this, is, this seems much more of a hierarchy. That seems much more of a, a network. So clearly, you know, there's some interesting organizational forms going on here. To look at some recent evidence, it's very descriptive evidence so far, but uh, I'm going to look at sort of, well, how much do these general practitioners feel uh, they own this organization? How much are they engaged? Look at what are their policies in terms of improving primary care delivery? External relationships, that's what, you know, links with clinicians, hospitals, public health, um, patients, how that's developing, and look at uh, how they're contracting and commissioning uh, services. I mean, so the first thing to point out is, well, there's, there's clearly a size relationship. So the, the, the larger, as you probably would expect, is these larger commissioning groups, the, the members don't really feel they own the, the group. I mean, only 35% responded that they, they feel that they own, that they're part of this, they feel part of this organization. Whereas the smaller groups, you seem to have a much, much more clear um, sense of, you know, we're, we're in this together, this is our, this is, this is our chance to, to do things. Again, in terms of engagement, there's a, there's a discontinuity between the, the board members, the people at the top of the hierarchy, and, and, and the grassroots. So, you know, the hierarchy, obviously, as you'd expect, you know, that the majority, 80%, feel they're really involved. But the grassroots, only just about 50% feel somewhat or, or highly involved. So there's this discontinuity in, 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 in these groups. So just to give a flavor of the sort of attitudes, I mean, this is commissioning, this is taking responsibility, financial responsibility, and, and not all doctors like this. I mean, we've seen in the past, from past reforms, there was a GP fund holding in the UK where they gave individual practices budgets. If it was voluntary, and we found that only about 50% of GPs actually wanted to, have, wanted to have a budget, 50% didn't. And yeah, this, this is reflected by these attitudes. You know, some GPs will say, you know, we, we shouldn't be taking responsibility for financial choices. You know, we should just be concentrating on patients and, and, and ignore the, the financial consequences. But other general practitioners will say, no, I mean, we're dealing with a population here. There's the decision for one patient is going to affect another. There's an opportunity cost, so we need to be financially responsible. Look at uh, development of primary care. Then, uh, essentially, performance monitoring was seen as something of a high priority. So there, there's a lot of peer pressure in these groups, which seems to be one of the main driving forces of different improvement. So they really want to compare each other's performance they want to look at um, referral rates, prescribing behavior, uh, how well they're doing in relation to their budgets, their allocated budgets. So yeah, they, they, they want to be very proactive amongst the members. Financial incentives, well, each, each practice is given like a budget and they're meant to, they're given some incentives. If they keep within their budget, they can keep some of the services. There's also a, a general sort of incentive on the clinical commissioning group, and that's coming from the government, so they're saying, you need to reduce avoidable mortality, as the Dennis highlighted. You need to reduce avoidable hospital admissions. So these are seen as targets which the groups have to achieve, and they give them extra money if they achieve these targets. And also, they want to develop referral pathways. So they're looking to um, implement sort of uh, referral management centers who, who will re review management practices, referral practices, looking to see if they can improve uh, guidelines and, and get more dialogue between clinicians. Uh, and yeah, so what they're prioritizing is mainly prescribing and, and um, referrals to secondary care. So those are the things they see as, as very controllable. And it's certainly, it, earlier evidence does seem to say that there's, there's big gains to be made in prescribing, big cost reductions without probably significant quality effects. Um, but also that, you know, concerned about access and, and experience. 
again, what are they prioritizing? Well, we've seen the big rise in emergency care. That's obviously seems to be the main priority. Um, urgent care and also long-term conditions, elderly care and mental health. But they're the four big areas. But yeah, there are there are signs of integrated looking to improve integration of care. There are there are a number of integrated care pilots which I won't have time to talk about, but if you're interested we can discuss them where they've tried to improve care integration. A quick summary of the overall findings. I mean the new organizations do seem to have changed things. You know, there's a high proportion of general practitioners on the board, about fifty percent. They they feel that they are much more engaged than they were in the past. Um, these locality groups are very important. Having having sort of lower level autonomous groups seems to make a big difference. Uh, in terms of development, um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, you know they're, they're keen to um, performance review, look at budgets. External relations is, is probably the weak area. So the, it may just be because it's early days and these groups have been concentrated on on forming as a new York administration administration, but they haven't made good links with. Um, secondary care with the acute sector or probably with public health and local authorities. Only 26% of these groups have a specialist position on their board and um, it may also have something to do with the system. The system is a, is a it's like a competitive system. You're, you're asking hospitals are, are, are competing for contracts with these groups so they may not be that keen to, to collaborate and share, and share information. They, they, they want to hold that information. If you're competing you want to keep that information private. So. I don't think I think there's a bit of a there's a bit of a discontinuity in the, the whole system if you want to sort of have both integration and uh, com uh, competition. And most groups are, are looking to commission. Okay, so that was a quick run through the, uh, the UK. Now I thought to um, well give you a, a view of uh, the Swiss bottom up approach. This is a typical Swiss bottom up approach. Um, in Switzerland, the situation is, is quite different. In, in the UK, what they're really trying to do is, with, with limited constrained resources, they're trying to achieve the best best possible care they possibly can with the quite limited investment. Whereas in Switzerland, the situation is more of, well, you know, we've got a very high quality, a very uh, expensive healthcare system with a lot of investment. Well, how do we how do we maintain that high quality but try and um, become more efficient while maintaining that high quality? So in Switzerland, the issue is really the, the rising expenditures and the, the, the burden of this rising expenditure is having on the population and how we can maintain the good sort of high quality healthcare system that exists while becoming more efficient. So we can see you know, households are um, funding healthcare is putting a greater burden on households. I think over the last ten years, it, it's reduced their expended, it's reduced their disposable income by about four percent. So what's happened in Switzerland to address these issues is, is managed care. So again, managed care is very much like a grassroots initiative by traditions. Um, the early start in Geneva and in Basel. Then, then the law subsequently changed to make um, managed care um, attractive. And I mean, the, the two main things would be that insurers or clinicians can selectively contract. They can they can choose certain providers or restrict patients to only be able to access care for certain clinicians. Um, to, to limit sort of free choice, but the other big area is really also it, it enables insurers and clinicians to share clinical data, and this is this is I think probably one of the most important innovations that that managed care did. So actually, you know, clinicians can have an idea of the costs, insurers can have an idea of the, the types of care people are using, and um, so we see that it's grown quite a lot. We've got um, at least eighty six. Physician networks across Switzerland, or, or health management organisations, and at least 50% of primary care physicians are, are practicing in, in a network in Switzerland. So yeah, it really has taken off. Okay, just quickly some different forms when you've got health management organisations, groups of large practices, sort of a mixed multi-specialty groups. You've got the physician networks, which are really more loosely, more flexible, open um, collaboration between doctors. Uh, they, they both, both these groups. You know, take financial responsibility, like like the commissioning groups you see in the UK. That they both have budgets to manage, and the insurance companies give them this this, this flexibility. There's some other models, uh, gatekeeping and telemedicine, which are, they're not really networks. They're just they're just sort of controlling access to specialist care. Okay, this is the, the growth. Just just to point out, there's quite a big difference in Switzerland across cantons, but yeah, we see really quite a significant rise in, in managed care enrollment in Switzerland. So. 
actually today, the majority of people are, are enrolled in the managed care plan. So over 50% are in the managed care plan. So um, this is this is clearly yeah, this, this is market forces that have driven this. I think it's, it's really the rising costs of premiums that have, have driven people into to managed care plan. Okay, so just quickly, what do managed care organisations do? Um, they're very keen on quality circles, you know, peer review, comparison across each other, um, uh, critical incident reporting. There's less, uh, there's less desire for, uh, there's less ability to integrate or cooperate with specialist care, but a lot do um, have selective contracting with providers, or, or they, they at least have preferred providers who they think are, are better quality, more efficient providers, and then they'll try and steer their patients to these specialist providers. Um, and also, they, there's quite a high proportion who are disclosing quality and cost data across the network. A quick review of the evidence. So, what's the what's the empirical evidence show on the impacts of managed care in Switzerland? Are they more efficient? Do they improve quality? Do they just do they just are they just good for insurance companies because they, they attract low risk, cheap patients? Or um, and how do professionals see it? I mean, overall, these groups do save money. I mean, all the empirical evidence I see shows that. They can reduce healthcare expenditures, even after you allow for the fact that they're attracting low-risk patients by between 8 and 46%. So recent work seems to show it's mainly in prescribing and in reducing general practitioner services. But also what's interesting is that it's, the evidence shows that in Switzerland, people also have quite high co payments So people have to pay quite a lot out of pocket. But there's been a nice paper by Peter Seifel, Constantine Beck, that shows that actually the managed care effect is much bigger than the high co payment effect. That managed care reduces costs much more than the sort of financial uh, co payment. Yeah, quality evidence is there's not such good evidence on quality. There's a bit showing, yes, they do have good disease management programs. Um, patient satisfaction, though, is, is much lower. This is a consistent finding with the US evidence. Uh, there is patient selection, and um, doctors generally don't like it. You know, doctors don't like be, they don't like the strong management influence of insurance companies. But they, 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 don't, they don't mind the peer review stuff that they quite like. They don't mind that, but they don't like they don't mind the they don't like the um, the strong emphasis. Okay, just to conclude, uh, they had a referendum in Switzerland to sort of make managed care more uh, integrated, uh, to make it the default system, but that was very heavily rejected. So, um, despite everyone being involved in managed care, it, it wasn't favourable. Okay, so I think it's a good to wrap up. I guess you put a little bit of pressure on, uh, on the time, sorry for, uh, for keeping you on time. So, uh, we go now to, uh, to Sal, and uh, I am very pleased to introduce uh, Marcel Thunder. He obtained a PhD in medical biology from the University of Basel and an MPH of the University of London, and he's uh, the director of the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute uh, and professor of epidemiology and medical parasitology at the University of Basel and at the Federal <coughs> of Technology. And last but not least, is the president of the Swiss School of Public Health. So, Master, thank you for your suggestion. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Luca. Thank you very much, everybody. Sorry for the change of people. We need a little bit of a uh, rotation of our staff from the institute owing to some traveling commitments we have. But it's actually not just we just took someone who was here, but we all, be it as Kaspar who replaced me on Monday and Ron who is not allowed to go to uh, Canada earlier, uh, we all have actually worked together on exactly the questions that we now discuss together. So, yeah, first point actually, I've written a thousand perspective because this is something which I was given as a title. But in fact, I would actually rather bring in the resource constraint perspective and not so much southern and developing countries. It is this research from a resource constraint. The other point which is important in this discussion, but we could hear at the end from Mark, Switzerland, it was one of the interesting experiences that uh, we could make, that we could share uh, some 10 years ago already our experience in resource constraint settings in the time when Switzerland discussed rationing and rationalization of healthcare. And the question was, 
what can we learn from areas where we are uh, actually having severe resources constraints? And a little bit what I would like to share with you is really this experience and how we came up to uh, networks, to manage networks in the, in the south or in resource constraint setting and how actually this experience could also inspire some of the next step we do in the north. So it's not just a question that when we go to loans, we have not a lot of money, and so then we just have to help with all these old, outdated concepts. We really have to think how, in this process of mutual learning, we can move ahead. So these are the challenges we write and we were, I mean, we had already through Dennis's presentation. We have the challenges in the disease system, a long list. We have the challenges of environment, you discussed it this week already. There are challenges of health systems and we have the challenges of population and behavior. And in red, you see the things that are particularly important for our discussion on the, on the networks, on the managed networks, and how we can come to more integrated approaches. I will already, if you read these red ones, you see this is seriously critical because that's a lot. And I think to deal with particularly and one thing without them going through all these challenges, what we underestimate in all these beautiful models that we have in our heads and concepts and policies is the dynamics of the population that have changed. I have started to work in Africa just a half a year later than Almata primary health care the declaration was made. And I followed all this way through, through this time, and we started at the situation that in many of the resources constrained countries, we had actually very stable communities. We had sometimes also ethnically quite homogeneous communities. You hear in all the talks, and you discuss it in your courses, what makes the biggest problem sometimes is this heterogeneity. And heterogeneity also in population dynamics. And without uh, actually overstating it, I think this is one of the key drivers why many of these initiatives of comprehensive approaches do not work because of the dynamics of the population. It's not so much that people don't understand, don't assume responsibility, but these tissues, these social tissues, are so dynamic. And these have analysis when you do the research. We are so much lagging behind. We do a cross-sectional study of something. Once the whole thing is published, you would go and check has changed already. So this is the situation of this. I always have to bring this. These are two slides that are nearly all for president. That's this one. And you actually could say because of that, and particularly if you don't have a lot of money, you can give up and you are in a situation like this donkey. And you ask the question how we can work. And our question here is uh, really these, uh, the adaptive strategies to transform. That's straight from Dennis's uh, point that he wanted to make clear. And it's, I say, yes, of course, that is. And, uh, but it is, depends in which context you do it. And it is the contextual issue. And for the resource constraints uh, countries, and that's why it's also something I always bring, which is underestimated, I see it also very often in the coursework, is really how actually this concept has changed. And when you start here from the Almata primary health care picture, up to 2008, deliberately, it's not because I, I, I stopped in 2008, but that's 30 years later, uh, and it's actually again a publication, these are the title pages of the reports, uh, uh, where it says primary health care more than ever. And what really has changed, you see, is that we actually come from comprehensive primary health care. And we actually could say to Dennis, his book is basically the tra uh, translation of the primary health care strategy of Alma Alta into action in a given setting. That's what it is, actually. But a lot has changed, you know, just briefly, the values have changed. We come from this broad approach, we come back now, and that this book is an exception uh, uh, to uh, also for content which is broad to narrow content, for focus which is on the process of interaction to more output orientation that we ask in, in our health system, from horizontal orientation to vertical orientation, from shorter and uh, from longer time frames to shorter ones. And then you should not forget, that makes this network story a little bit difficult, that that's how we are confronted in these research constrained countries. That at the beginning, when we started with having this comprehensive, the nearly only player was WHO. 
And nowadays, I could not fill all these arrows with all the players that run around. That's just a few selected. And the system support was very friendly when we were uh, trying to translate Almata. And it is actually nowadays more hostile because systems sometimes are working against clear outputs and very vertical approaches. And that's particularly true in, in, in uh, resources constrained countries. And of course, we know very much that we could hear from before systems dependency group. So this we have to reconcile in, the, in these resources constrained countries. How do we bring these different uh, strategies uh, or different dependencies and change values uh, together from the system support to the change focus of values and so on. And this is very important for you to have not so much the resources constraints experience. We had after Alma Atta the big UNICEF initiatives. And that's how dangerous when I say that this is maybe was not a very good idea to dissect this comprehensive thinking into very vertical strategies. The delay we had to really bring such networks together was because one said, oh, that's very difficult, everything integrated, everything linked together. So let's do a mother child health program, let's do an essential drug program, let's do a vaccination program. And then actually the idea of having the integrated approaches, care and prevention in the periphery got lost. And then comes when you talk about health system, that everybody has another idea of the health system. These are just a few quotes of the whole story. Everybody, we could do the job, uh, the thing here, maybe you have done it in some courses. Everybody has another idea of what the health system is, or a, or, or a network is. And then we have in our resource constraint setting very often the strict WHO dependency on what the WHO says. That's why WHO gives the guidelines and the countries listen to the guidelines. Now that's the WHO 2000, it's not so a long time ago definition of a well health system. The yellow functions, you deliver services with stewardship and financing, etc. etc. And you have goals that of course you have the health status at the end, you are responsive to people, and that's a fair financial contribution. That's not my graph, that's the copy of the WHO graph. And then you really clearly see, and I think one course has this discussed this, there's one thing very uh, lacking. Where do you get the information from? There's nowhere where you actually actually have an information that feeds into decision making and resources allocation. And the other thing which is not clearly stated in this model, how do we actually maintain equity in the system? And how actually the health system and social systems belong together? That's why we have delays in bringing ideas that Dennis has so nicely presented into such settings because these links are missing. The equity concern as well as the social system link. The diagnosis of better health in Africa, that's the title of a book that was written about 12 years ago, showed these are the issues. So we have all these beautiful concepts and these are the issues. That's not only one country, these are, it's generally that you can actually, with ten dollars per capita or less, you cannot achieve what you would like to achieve. But also the, all these new interventions are coming, you should go to scale, all, and you have also new diseases that are coming. And I think this is really, how do you really do that? How do you bring this beautiful concept this together? A short insight. Tanzania is, the health system looks like that. That is the analysis only of the medicines and technology building blocks within the health system. And I'm sure you're all seriously confused when you look at that. And here you should operate. You would put, like to put another network on the whole story. But the problem is here really, I think, the, that all, everything is totally fragmented. And therefore, and that's what Don Desamani was here, was one of the key drivers of this systems thinking book. Actually, when we brought together this experience we have from work in the situation. System thinking is now further, it is more practice. And the model of the health system are these balls there. And this is designed like that to show how much actually this is interdependent. When you start to move these balls, you should take this as real balls, we could show it with real balls here. You touch one ball and all the other knots start to move around it as well. And I think this is this interdependence and the system thinking is exactly not the reductionism, but is actually interrelations and dynamics. 
And the Dennis's input is really focusing on these interactions and dynamics. That's this thinking. Not how to find more separations and fragmentation. And it's solution driven. And it is not just actually problem driven. And in this set of thinking you have to first overcome if you really want to make a change in a health system. And that's the approach that is actually not new, but that has been floating all the time. That's why it is absolutely crucial that we try to see in large countries how we can actually do it at the subnational level, not like in Switzerland, this 26 health system, where we have actually an, atomizing, uh, an atomized health system into 26 countries. But how do we really reach to have these beautiful networks, these families, these communities, and how do we interact with traditional social systems, etc.? And here the key word, and we could stop here, is decentralization. And decentralization, you don't need a large lecture on this. This has to be thinking through how do you delegate authority and power. And one of the problems why these networks do not work is that not enough power is delegated. People always delegate responsibility, and they call it professional working. You hear that everywhere. But that's not professional if you only delegate responsibility. To make such networks work, and this didn't come out so much in these talks, is really this bringing responsibility and power into the hands of other actors. It's less the hierarchical structure, it is the well delegation of responsibility and power. That's our experience where it worked in Africa. We do decentralization when we want to go more rational. You want to involve people, you want to have the community voice, you want to contain costs, reduce inequalities and so on. I did not write now a lot about public-private mix, but that's actually also what it is. In a system where you have a large part of a private sector, I think it is very important that you go into sub-national levels in order to bring the private and the public player together, provided you have an overall legislation on the public-private mix. Then you can really live it. It depends if you're in a peri-urban area, in a very rural area and so on. This public-private mix and the dynamics are different. Therefore, to have one thing for a health planning in one country will never ever work. That's why a key again, how you bring these networks working, is really to go to this, uh, to, uh, to this uh, decentralization. Now decentralization is used in a very sloppy way, very often. Decentralization has many phases. And there are mixed possible. You can decentralize deconcentration, you only decentralize administrative authority. You can do uh, a devolution, a delegation. But also privatization is part of decentralization. And in many countries you have a mixture of these approaches. And why do I say that is not to be theoretical? If you analyze the situation for how you can make work such a uh, care, network integrated care, you must understand that each of these different forms of decentralization have a different impact on how networks work. They have a great impact on how you interact with the people, with the civil society, how you bring them in, in the, in the, in the experience we have so nicely seen before. And this is the other graph which always comes up. Because this is the other graph that is actually we always have to think how we come from an efficacious, good quality intervention to effectiveness at the population. What it is all about, what you want to achieve in, this, in, in an integrated care is that you are not efficacious, that you are effective. And if you don't see how actually you can kill, you can see your efficacy decline from not full access not targeting the right people that should be targeted, not having the provider compliance and not having the consumer adherence or the consumer compliance. Then you see, you can do your own examples and you can have more steps in your stairs, but it always goes downwards. The probability that all events are true uh, leads that for it's in this uh, situation from 80% of something great you have is only 30% of community effect. There comes another term which is important if you really want to see how such networks work is actually the term of equity effectiveness. And the equity effectiveness is different from effectiveness because 
you not only ask how are these, who are these, uh, uh, or how do you achieve 30%, but you also ask who are these 30%. You know, when people come and tell us all the time, you visit health facility, then they say, you know, we have a coverage of 80%. Or they show you very often when you go from different health facilities in uh, poor areas, they always have this graph on the wall. Nowadays they have it on the computer which shows how coverage goes up. And of course the first thing you have to tell them, great, it's wonderful. Because it doesn't go down, it goes up. But then you must ask the question, who are the 80% that you reach with your service? And then sometimes it's very quiet in the room. Because I, I'm not so much interested in the 80%, I'm interested in the 20%. Those you know. Because that's where actually all these famous terms of equities matter. And I think this is very important when you have networks running, be it here in rich Switzerland or uh, be it in the Quebec uh, health authorities, you always have to ask, when, how is my equity effectiveness? Not so much effectiveness. That's maybe a take home message that we can afterwards discuss. So, a quick thing which some have seen, you know, in this millennial development also, again you have guiding principles. Africa is red where we should go, blue where we were at the midterm evaluation that you see all the continents somehow okay, but Africa was far off. And many people have said that's clear, they, they, this is Africa, it's very difficult and so on, but with no specificity. And it is the Canadian, it's interesting, Canadian investment in trying to make it work actually led to such graphs that some of you have seen, but that's exactly the illustration on how you can work with managed networks. These were two districts that were very badly off. Red is the line what you should be, where you should be, and at the end you see two districts that were very badly off, and suddenly in 96 something changed, and they went down, that means a reduction of a childhood mortality rate in a very fantastic way, and you ask what has been done. The key was that in a very restrained situation of eight capita per uh, eight dollars per capita for health, this project, the Tanzania Essential Health Intervention Program, added one US dollar per capita. No new drug, no new vaccine, no new intervention, but only established district health teams. Not only public sector, private, public, community voices, and these district health teams have to establish a district health plan per year. The first plan was, of course, not very good, but more and more they get very clear, showing who plays, who is where, with who has which role and responsibility, and how actually these things are financed. And then everybody said, hey, uh, this is only for about 1 billion people. This is, does not work for the whole country with 35 million. And all these tools that were used for the team and the plan were brought into 130 districts that Tanzania has. And then you saw suddenly that it also had an effect for the whole country, also heterogeneity, depending on people, of course, and the management. But we then reached a situation of an 11% annual decline of mortality. These are health outcomes generated by a network approach. That's a district health management team is actually a managed network, if you want to translate it like that. That's how we understand it in these situations. And in 2010, Tanzania has reached before, five years before, the Millennium Development Goal of Childhood Mortality. And that is a clear effect of such a managed network, how it works. A country, not a village, not the district, the country. I think this is very important. It changed all this at district level. It reduced the inefficiencies and inequities. We could reallocate staff and uh, resource packages, and preventive packages, curative packages. We had actually delivery strategy changes. We could increase with this the effectiveness. And we could also improve supervision and monitoring. Not monitoring and evaluation as hunter-gatherer operation, which I said one year ago here in this room, or two years ago, but as actually as in a perspective of surveillance. It's 
Das war nur ein F. Aber das war mir. <lacht> es ist die, der Thing, that in the ever you monitor, my dear colleagues, the new motion monitor is an aspect of surveillance. Never as hunter gatherer. Because that's utterly useless. You should not be inspired by the global fund that collects thousands of data that are actually not searching for anything. And you are in charge of people and you work in a decentralized setting and you want to manage a network. Your view must be a surveillance view so that you can immediately see and act, not collect and develop. This is wonderful. That is actually the current the change in, the, in how we actually look at this primary health care today. We've achieved a lot. And this is the graph from WHO, at least these issues of the reform part, the, uh, the, uh, the service reform part, the universal coverage, etc. is there. There are still major challenges. And they are all the same, but the most important thing is really to get out over the fragmentation. Not frag in a fragment, look at community participation alone. Because that's linked to your district health team and your plan, etc. etc. And that is what we learn. This is how do we really do this graph effectively. <coughs> that is still our problem in most of the countries. And you see this graph here, and then is this graph. It's not so different. If it really is well done, and why, how is it well done? This is my, my final point. You see, as my the children now, it's very good, my dear friend from Burkina Faso, the children from Burkina Faso, and, uh, and that is what you have to do if you want to go towards the network and integrated approach. That's your job. You have to walk the tight road. And you have actually to balance all these issues. And a little bit the summary would say, primary health care is integrated care. It's not something for the poor, as you could see today very often. It's just sometimes that we in the north, we forget about that. And it is actually the integrated health system. Of course it's different if you have different parts of the private sector, etc., etc. And the successes so far we had with these managed networks were actually where the system approach is coherent. Not that you just have read the book systems thinking and you think you have done it or it is this uh, book. And the decentralization, I would be not for, not just for semantics. With Luca, who talked about bottom up and top down, this is actually something diagonal or something like that. That actually you need in certain areas actually a very clear top down. You cannot everything just have grown from the bottom. Because otherwise it gets to the general feel me, touch me atmosphere where everybody can just do what they want. Some lines must be clear, particularly when you don't have a lot of resources. And, we have, and the most important thing is where roles and responsibility are. You can do a lot in your setting if you better see who has which role and which responsibility. These networks, so nicely described by uh, Dennis's uh, experience from Quebec, only work if this is very well done. And of course, the respective sector reforms. But, and this is the but, there's too much fragmentation still. And the problem is that too many fragments are still well functioning. You know, you have very beautiful NGO networks, and they are so happy to be an NGO network, but forget about in which context the NGOs have to operate. There are wonderful HIV AIDS treatment and preventive networks, but they are sometimes totally detached from health systems. But we have uh, many other, uh, the community health funds are also so beautiful things. They are actually sometimes totally detached from the planning exercise. Because people only look at the community health funds and they don't look at the planning process, consequences, a coherent a systemic approach, network approach. As well. The great things nowadays in M&E and whatever health, in telehealth, again sometimes totally detached and the minister tells you in many countries, I'm overwhelmed. All these people come with the E and M devices and say, look here, you see, you can see, manage the whole health system. <laughs> but of course, they have five different systems and this is not integrated. These are the, my, my worries. It's not just jokes. This is actually what uh, destroys a lot of, of, of our approach. And I think that's why we should really fight back and be comprehensive, not only in the thinking, but also in the action.
It's difficult to comprehensive action, but it, it one should then not rigor by just making fragments work. I would say poor countries and resource constrained countries, there are positive things. If you look what I showed you in Tanzania, what we see in Uganda, Ghana, Mozambique, Botswana, this is in Africa, very promising. And we've lost that, we've left out maybe some, but these are the ones I know from really concrete own work. And in Brazil is this, uh, this universal health system which actually is a huge network over the country, which is one of the new policies where they try to bring in a very complex brick country with very poor people, with very high tech uh, situation. They try to provide an umbrella. I'm very much interested to learn what happens. Yeah. These are a few inputs and I could not have talked to you without thanking you all because always being together with a group like this and many others that I have the privilege to meet is this real process of mutual learning about change. My question is, uh, uh, we have uh, now learned about the health networks of conditions in the developed countries and uh, the rich countries, and also with uh, Marcel, we know how it works in the countries with limited resources. Then my question would be, what is the uh, primary precondition to start uh, the health networks creation or to make them operational? The first one, I mean, the, the first driving force in the countries was uh, limited resources, highly fragmented, vertical, and competing for the funds. Thank you. In the Danish situation, we are now restructuring the GDP network, and what we can uh, what we can feel and notice every day in the press throughout the past six months is a deep distrust in the methods and methodologies of different health economists. Being a clinician, I have been to meetings where health economists from different Danish parties or different uh, universities have been coming, called in to talk about one topic, one solution, and three people were called in, one after each other, and coming up with different solutions or proposals or analysis. So, challenge to you, are we ready now to put out open algorithms and share data and information on it to allow that this distrust is removed. In Denmark, the discourse actually led to that all GPs seriously considered delivering back their whole licenses to the state and going back to a privately paid system. And, and this, for me as a medical system, is a very, very serious situation because if the distrust is so high that they say all these analysis just as numbers, as models, it has nothing to do with I'm trying to cure patients. So, so do you see a good way for health economists to come in? Maybe should we allow you early in all our studies or what's the way to do it? The creation of networks. I think it's wrong to think about creation. I think that is where the bottom-up approach is very important. You must animate what is there. And you know you should never try it. That is actually a problem that we see in public and international health. Too many people start creating. That's great to be a creator, but I think uh, it's it's also very much better when we really want to do something for the communities to animate what is there. People in very difficult situation have actually better ideas sometimes than these uh, big specialists. So this is not just going for a, an approach where you just let things go, but the role that you get these networks together. In the case of the African experience I have, but a little bit of Asian as well, or for instance, Pacific experience recently on health planning that I have, it is really to, to see already, because these district health teams or these networks are basically ready, what you need to do is to animate what is there. Where you destroy a lot if you come and say, I do health sector reform in a country. I'm a consultant and I will tell you how I, I, I will do this. Then things go seriously wrong. This animation, you know, that's why actually you must first listen and see before you actually talk. That's by the way when you have two eyes and two ears and only one eyes. That is what people often forget. And then you actually an, an, animate this. And I think a lot of the good things that have been done also, I, I, I believe, from 
uh, from the Quebec experience is really a lot of more animation than creation. And all of you in your situation should really build on this animation thing. But of course you do this rigorously, even aggressively, that you are committed to bring these elements together. That's my experience in doing these things. And not coming with this template on how do you do health sector reform. I think that is where you correctly ask. When we all went in the 90s into the health sector reforms, we got actually these templates from the World Bank and other uh, brilliant people who actually then translated into a real situation, destroyed more than they an ever animated. And because it was co not contrary to traditional, it was just contrary on how people have tried to solve the problems they have. But this should really not go into a very bottom-up thinking in only. It goes also, you must be very, very often directive in this animation. This is not a overruling and over authority, but you need to give some lines and in order to do this animation towards those even aims that the people have. I think that would be my answer to the first one. The Danish situation, we will have to answer it. But I would like to uh, I totally agree with uh, what has been said. Uh, in my words, I would say um, shared vision, leadership, willing to change something, and collaborative leadership is very much required. So, will is a key founding element. If you don't have will around you, it's it's too heavy a change to carry for a single individual or even a single organization or even a single minister or prime minister. You need to have this collective will to move up, move on the agenda, and that was present in our context. I think in the states that was uh, also a key a key driver for enabling some thing to happen. Yeah, as, as an economist, I'd say yeah, you have to create the right um, the right organizational financial infrastructure. And I think you know, if you want to have a create a, net, a network, an integrated network, you know, you, you allocate funds and budget to to cover the, the expenditures, the costs across all the areas that you you want to see finance. And then also to help facilitate that, I think you also need to you probably also need to pay people a bit more for the extra effort that um, they're going to put in. I mean, that, that's on the financial side, but obviously you also need to motivate people to, to be part of the network. So that motivation can't always be completely financial, but I mean, what we see from the UK is that the GP <coughs> will say, listen, I've only got so much time and resources. I'm not being reimbursed anything for this extra effort. And you know, we would like a little bit of extra money to, to cover our, our costs of this commitment. You know, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of it's a lot of managerial work, and they want a bit of extra remuneration, but they, they also want to see they also want to see the benefits of doing this. So it's not just a question of the money; they also want to see that this is achieving the benefits. And then and that's a, the, the Danish question is to me is very interesting. So I mean, so is it is it more around they're creating these new networks and health economists are saying you know uh, these networks are going to be financed? You're going to like have a budget, and and, and the health economists are coming in and say this is how you should be making decisions to allocate this money and, and, and the, the, the doctors aren't comfortable with, they're not comfortable with making allocation financial decisions. The, the Danish government, and here I have to take, be careful because I've been working for them for two years now, is it seriously considering like Holland to change the payment model, making just what you described, I love your presentation very much, larger networks changing the structure on, of the general practice uh, way in general. Which is, I believe personally, a very good approach. But what happened during the process is that different uh, economists and analysts came in with, for the politicians, opposite views on what the solution was, which even made a much higher frustration. And the worst thing for us and the public was the whole thing was turned on throughout the media. 
So, so in television interviews, we could hear that you should close all GB practices. The next day, we could hear that they all should work in state-owned centers. And the next day, you would hear the president of the, of the doctor's association talking that now we were ruining all healthcare in Denmark with build-up over the past 30 years. <laughs> and, and my question is, how can we, together, uh, as collaborators, prevent things like that fr from happening? Because it's kind of very counterproductive against, I, I detected late in my career, health economy as an important tool to do stuff. So, so what can be done to, to, to do this? Is this just a, a too little developed culture from some Danish health oppositing uh, health economist, or is this something ha ha happening everywhere in the other countries you think is absolutely uh, describing the situation in general? My answer might be partial, but I would suggest that uh, uh, you should really start changing the conversation with safety and quality data to establish the connection to what's the, really the uh, professional ethical agenda for any physician or uh, by and large any health professional. So if you start the conversation with this in mind and with primary quality data, then you can uh, open up the system's perspective, bring, out the, uh, bring on board the additional pieces of information that helps us have a better grasp of the system dynamics, and then the costs are relevant, and uh, the, the type of processes that are more the managerial bit, you know, are also relevant, and then you connect and you you, you, you develop a uh, better understanding, a more global, and this comprehensive understanding of the reality. But if it's not anchored in this area of quality, you, people won't follow the conversation and they will shift to other, you know, common, current interests that they have. Like, they are busy people, highly committed people, so they don't, they don't care really. But quality, quality is really the anchor of the new conversation. So I would suggest, and there's some evidence uh, in the materials that I've seen, uh, the IHI has published uh, enormously in this area, and that's, I think, their key for condition for success. And maybe to ask a little, uh, to, add, uh, to add a little bit on this whole discussion, I think, of course, the, the information and the data are key, the good quality. And I, I think a lot of the problems are, as you could see in my semantic drawing, the WHO does not emphasize that. I find this is a very uh, horrendous oversight. It took long, until about eight years, until they corrected this whole thing. And this has actually deteriorated sometimes, this situation. People did not see that this is actually an important building block. The other point, I think, is the, is the situation. That's why we are here together as the Swiss School of Public Health, we were initially called, and it's still here, the Swiss School of Public Health Plus. I can say that as a nonsense, basically, because a public health without the uh, without, uh, with, without economy is, is nothing. So this plus will basically not be needed. But you should also not trust too much on the economists, you see. Public health development in Denmark is maybe not a very, uh, very mature one thinking about public health. And our mission in, the, in, the, in public health here in this country is to go beyond the classical understanding of public health, which comes out of the old hygiene thinking and so on. It's clearly rooted in, in, in the medical uh, profession. That is very, very, very clear. But we have to develop that. That's our, we are not yet there. That's why we still have the plus here in the public health. But I think this is when you ask what can you do is, first of all, you could be a promoter after such an interaction of public health in your country. Because that is maybe there where it needs more. And the, and the other thing is also when you, when you look, when we talked at the beginning of creation, it needs financial means, what Mark correctly has said. That is absolutely clear, but that's also not, a, that is a, also a sort of facilitation, be it at the level of incentive or be it of having the means. And there the problem is that even if we have changed our paradigms in health planning in 1993 and we said investing in health, many governments do not act as investors. 
And even the private sector does not act as investor. And as investor means as also a donor organization. I see this in poor countries a little bit. You get support for a health system. But everything is prescribed, you know, this hopeless micromanagement that they don't trust the, the local initiative. And if you are an investor and if you want to invest in good health, you must leave it to exactly those teams to make the resource allocation. But if those who have the money are actually wanting, thinking uh, to micromanage the whole thing, even for large firms, then uh, you can analyze each country, it doesn't work. And I think this is something which is the difficult trade-off between the good governance question and this investor behavior. But I think in health, with all the nice declarations, we do not behave enough as investing for health. The, um, there is a, a one advantage and one great disadvantage in, uh, uh, in economics right now. The advantage is that the economics is a theory-driven uh, science. So there is a lot of theory behind, which is good because you need to have a, uh, an idea of, uh, of the world in order to, uh, to draw some, some conclusions. The other point is that much of this theory is completely uh, irrelevant for the world. Uh, in the sense that uh, uh, in the description of human being, per definition in economics, is a very simple one. The human being are person looking uh, for their interest. So this is, of course, one important dimension, but it's not the only one. Uh, there are uh, a lot of things going on, uh, trying to increase and to have a more generous view on the human being, including commitment, persuasion. Um, uh, I mean, there are other stuff uh, uh, of uh, important dimensions that, that make our life uh, meaningful. So I think this is uh, what I learned in these years, interacting with public health, that using our economics uh, stuff, we, we need to embrace a more uh, large view of the world. And uh, really to, to, to enter in this world, uh, something is happening, uh, because otherwise our response would be, uh, in order to get the goal, you, you need either to uh, pay or to control. And pay is another form of control. If you understand that uh, uh, reward is different from incentive, reward uh, means also commitment, also another um, uh, dimension, then you start to have a more broader and more effective uh, uh, intervention. I think this is my, at least my point. So sorry for stealing okay. your time. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Amado. I am from Burkina Faso in West Africa. So my question is, uh, um, I mean, from Mark and Dennis talk, uh, primary healthcare improvement and development is a main challenge for all, even in Canada and UK. So after Marcel, I understand that dynamic and integration can be the best way, but how can we improve the rural uh, community primary healthcare? by organizing them. How can we organize the community in a rural area to improve the community with primary health care? The second question is how to have health financing for sustainability in Africa. Uh, when we know that uh, we have many, many finance from external, but we can improve the health financing from the local community and it can be sustainable. But I don't know what is your idea. Thank you. You see, these are important <coughs> questions. In, and the way is to ask for the community organization. And I think here, the, way, the situation has really changed with the dynamics of the population, the migration dynamics and everything. It is very, very difficult. We first faced it in the urban areas, but now you face it in the rural areas as well. And I think the only way has to do with really this having my experience for the African setting is to really establish good district health management team. So decentralization and the, and the district health management is not only the public sector people, really, but these are also community representative and, and that actually this, when you have such a team, then this is really a group that works in the spirit that 
uh, Lucas tried to, uh, to, try to uh, describe Mr. Valley. And I think this is something which our experience shows when you, when you get such a team together at the beginning, of course, it's not easy. Very difficult. But we will certainly not get, need to get this an external facilitator. You must first have to get those who are responsible for part in this, in this sector to, uh, to really to find together. And I think that has worked. The, the positive examples are very much done by, uh, uh, by basing themselves very strongly on the district health management team. And one course actually tries to do that to give you health planning with limited resources, but they exactly have to do that. The act has a team. And this is this not theoretical, that's the practice. And this leads to your second point. If you have in a situation a real good such team and plan where it says these are our roles and these are the activities and that's who is responsible for and that's how it is paid for. In many of these situations, you get you get uh, you get the what means sustainable in our world, but you get longer term commitment from from inside and outside, or inside means from the population as well. And there's a very good example of again our Tanzania. Tanzania is now it has been the pet of development cooperation for many countries, based on and. Nowadays, there are other people who say that this country is a failed state because everything is was nice when we are there did and how it evolved, but there are still many things that don't work anymore. And even in this difficult situation, if you it works and it's not a failed state in those areas where you have exactly for health these teams established, that's where actually still can assure that funding comes also from the people who participate in very, very poor areas, in South and Tanzania, for instance. And it, it still brings in the commitment of the so-called donors, despite the other discussion. So again, it roots in this nucleus that is such a large country, you really need to go to a decentralized approach. And this is the thing, and you will see in Burkina Faso, it's small, but also there we have a huge heterogeneity where this approach will be the one to overcome. Look to your neighbor Mali, even in a difficult situation now. That's where also the, this decentralization in a reasonable way, not the Swiss way with 26 systems for 7 million people, uh, is, 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 is actually going to work. By all means possible to maintain public health leadership and clinical leadership working very closely together. This split is extremely uh, delicate and it may not lead to a real improvement. If we, we all understand that we're working on the uh, interdependent determinants. So if we split responsibility, we're adding fragmentation, we're introducing competition for resources and that's not, that's not good. And it tends to be uh, a very strong basic trend that we have to fight against. So if you have some uh, ability to influence implementation, try to synergize those two strategies, public health leadership and clinical leadership in the district team would be really uh, synergistic. The will has to come, well, in Bangladesh, the will came from the government. You know, they said we want to prioritize improvements in rural healthcare. And there wasn't just a, wasn't just a focus on healthcare, it was all infrastructure, you know, bridges, roads, yeah. network connections. So, and that, yeah, that made a big difference in Bangladesh. And then, yeah, and then maybe networks can help because, you know, these rural communities, it's hard to attract people to, it's hard to attract people to work there, but you, you can just, if you establish networks with, you know, central health, the healthcare facilities so that at least people have leads with um, the, the better, more um, more attractive areas, then it can attract people to work in the rural areas. Yeah, so yeah, that's going to be the challenge. It's also attracting people to be able to work in the rural areas. But, but networks can help that because you say you, you, if you're not isolated, you've got strong links with our, our main facilities. So Bangladesh is the example which after the um, whole difficult political situation 73 after the war 
and that I really to make an effort, an example of really what you all this right down intersectorial collaboration. Because there was very clear you cannot, and that's a very good example where, as Mark says, roads were done at the same time as we would actually uh, do health centers and so on. This massive investment of this very poor corner of the of former East Pakistan actually was necessary. And that's where it shows that it's, it, these networks about, uh, largely across sectors, you see, have actually uh, produced the, uh, uh, good results. And part of this a same approach for better health, if you look within India, and I think you, uh, you can do many analyses, but the, the fact why Kerala state in India is much, much better off is also this, this larger network thinking which are part of the sectorial collaboration. I mean, it's now a little bit on shaky, but it has been the boost for the better indicators and they are particularly also education, not just health education from the health sector, but really massive investment in women's education that has catapulted this state into a much better situation. Plus, what you discussed yesterday, the nutrition situation, nutrition, a very clear investment in nutrition. And I think, so at the end, the health investments directly into health services was little compared to the other sector that has produced much more on the health side. Uh, why? Because business is a very good business, uh, health is a very good business and at some point we are all part of that business. We at some point want to do things, we want to help, but we profit of that system as well. So my question is, you shouldn't sometimes just accept this and direct our theoretical thinking of instead of how to tackle these problems on better how to just accept this and how to bypass this and, and live with that and find ways of, of living with those uh, issues and just find other ways to, to go with them along. I mean, this is, I would not agree with that. No. I think we cannot accept the level of fragmentation our society goes. This is some, but we, of course we don't aim for the ideal. But at least, you know, should it, these ideal theoretical things should be not, like a star that helps you to navigate. And I think nowadays everybody has GPS, that's why they don't know how to use a star to navigate. That's the problem. Uh, but it's really the way that you should not accept just that you make a smaller box and a smaller box and a smaller box. That you cannot totally eliminate fragmentation is clear to everybody. Right? It's not naive. But there are numerous examples which we can discuss here or in, in, uh, in Basel uh, and how actually we really have had success by not accepting that fragmentation has to be like that. The experience of Quebec is also they didn't accept how it went before and they try to find a new way forward. And that is not saying naively everything is great and it's all uh, now uh, solved, but it is a clear direction to reduce fragmentation and people still make money in, in their own business and so on, but actually really to have a better contribution uh, to the to, to, to health development. I think that's, I think we should not, we cannot just sit here and accept, that's why you are here, that would be my last word. And that's why I use this all this time. Mutual learning for change. What I expect that we exchange here, and then we change afterwards in our, in our, in our uh, public health practice or whatever practice we are. And I think this is what we get, not accepting facts that we know that are actually affecting negatively or just not developing health development. We have to accept autonomy and maybe encourage autonomy, but we have to manage greater interdependency. There are two complementary driving forces for improvement. So, is fragmentation autonomy? No. But it's related concepts, so we have to play with this, but I think autonomy is a key driving force for human beings and human societies. But it's not to be infused with fragmentation because we are all interdependent. If we, in, if we, uh, we cannot build from this basic law of nature, 
then we're, we're going, you know, in, in, our, in the outer space without any direction. That's my opinion. Yeah, that, I think it's a nice question. I think it, I mean, the economist was kind of well, wrestling with this issue in healthcare, you know, and saying, what should we do? Should we fragmentation? You can even people that say we should just have competition. We should have lots of competition, free entry, private, public. Lots of patient choice, let them make the decisions. You can sort of see that as fragmentation. Um, and then others will say, well, integration networks, fine, you've got coordination, but then that, that restricts, that's restricting patient choice. Patients don't like that, but also, I mean, networks actually create monopolies. It could stifle innovation. Some economists say, well, that's going to stifle innovation. You know, you, you're restricting access to this network um, just to those who can provide the care. So, yeah, I think it's quite a, it's quite a good debate. Um, I don't know what the what the, the solution is, but at the, I mean, the moment, I know from the UK at the moment, it's like, it's actually, there's, there's two of the same policies overlapping each other. So at the same time, they want integration, they've actually, well, due to competition law, they actually have to open up the market to all providers. So it's, it's something which is unresolved. Yeah.